if Time Team came back and you were able to have Time Team for a couple sure. of weeks, <laughs> from anywhere you like, a site, a battle, a person, a location, an object, off the top of your head, do you, do you have any sense where you'd like to take us? And you'd obviously <laughs> join us in the dig as well. Well, I really would would be so thrilled to join you on a dig. I, I can't begin to say. Well, I, there are, you'll not be surprised to know, um, two places, really. Um, one is, of course, uh, the Pyrenees, in that despite the fact that there were, you know, whole teams from Vevelsberg and then Nazi grail hunters under, you know, doing all of that excavation. In the end, they found really nothing. And that's that's fascinating because all of the stories around Montsegur, when you when you think about excavating in an area like that, you think they well, nowadays you'd be able to find anything. But when you're there and you're standing on top of one of the mountains, or certainly you're right at the top on the, the San Bartholomew or the Peak de Sudorac, and there are caves everywhere. Um, now, of course, there's modern technology, but I, I do still feel history suggests that something was taken from that mountain. Uh, we know the names of two of the Cathars who left the mountain at great risk to themselves and their families. I, in my novel, give an explanation of what it is. But the fact that it is mentioned in many different areas, just to excavate properly, not there, but close by, I do still wonder what, what left, what left that night, um, you know, before, and why it was so important for them to stay up there for Easter. And then they all just gave up and walked down. So they surrendered, but asked for a two weeks grace period, which nobody knows why it was given. A second site is um, would be close to here, uh, yeah. which is is Kingly Vale. That there are so many stories about uh, the the men of Sussex defending against the Viking raids, the mythology of the yew trees in Kingly Vale. It's the oldest yew forest in uh, Europe, and some of the yew trees in the heart of the forest are said to be a thousand years old. And of course, there's a lot of mythology around yew trees, and you you know the red sap. But there's some, there are some versions of the story which says that the oldest yew trees sprung up where the Vikings were cut down. And the, the, the other mythology says that it is the blood of the Saxons who protected the Sussex downland. Um, and of course, that hasn't been properly excavated because the trees matter more. Um, but the idea right in the heart of that yew forest, I do wonder if there, there really are multiple graves there. And that would be the most extraordinary thing, because when you're in the heart of that wood, you you're not in the 21st century. You know, I walk there most days and yesterday, because most people don't walk around on a Monday. There was nobody around. I saw deer. I saw many, many pheasants. I heard incredible raptors kind of wheeling overhead. And you think, you know, the, the, the way that your feet feel on that land is how their feet would have felt on that land a thousand years ago. And it's the most extraordinary, magical place. Well, I'm going to put you down in our, we have a project called the Aura Project, A-U-R-A, -A, the Authors Unit for Research into Archaeology. Brilliant. We've, we've talked with Bernard Cornwall about it and Philippa Gregory and Sir Michael. Fabulous. Bernard, and said, look, you know, you ask us where you'd like to go. We'll do a background research and, and one day we will concentrate Fabulous. on Fabulous. <laughs> I shall have my boots ready, <laughs> polished and ready. <laughs> um, I know you've moved on to the Huguenots now. I just want to stop a little bit still with Sepulchre and Citadel. It struck me that one of the problems we often have archaeologically is we, we know Ithaca very well. And of course, Ithaca has its Odysseus story. Um, I happen to live in England, in Cornwall. They have the Tintagel story. Cool. And Ren Le Chateau has the um, Sonier and the bloodline. It often strikes me that those stories sit there and archaeologically they dominate. Uh, the, everybody, they go there and they want to find this, they want to find that. Mm -hmm. One of the things we've been looking at with projects is something we call Dig Village, but in a sense it's saying, let's find a community and go back through the past. So 
I know very little about it, but when I've looked at Rennes, the chateau, there's the Roman past, there's yeah. even a Neolithic, Mesolithic past. And one of the things archaeologically that's fun to do, rather than going, let's be the one that finds the Ark of the Covenant sort of thing, yeah. is to say, if we were planning to tell the history of this place over a number of uh, years with a number of objects, you mentioned Neil McGregor, archaeologically speaking, what could we begin to do to build that story up? Mm. Um, and that can be a rather nice project so that um, Mick Aston, uh, who was one of the leader of Time Team's archaeological yeah. team and the inspiration of Time Team, really, he was a field archaeologist, a landscape archaeologist. Yeah, yeah. And he was very good at doing that. Here's this, we're looking at this villa or this burial site, but what is the bigger context? And I think one of the things we've increasingly done with our friends like Carenza and Stuart and, and John is to go to sites and set a wider context, the landscape. And now, yeah. as you know, some of the magic that archaeology has, which I think is, is quite magical, we've yeah. got the geophysics so we can see beneath the ground, we've got the LIDAR, we can fly over the top, and we've got a wonderful thing, which I think you might have fun with, called an XRF, X-ray fluorescence. <laughs> There's a wonderful object in Bronze Age, the, from the Bronze Age in Germany, which is called the Nebra Sky Disc. And I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of it. It's a no. big bronze disc, Bronze Age disc, with little gold shapes all over it. And people looked at this for a long time. And suddenly uh, somebody said, well, I wonder if it's a pattern of the stars and they cleaned it and drew it, and it turned out to be a map of the stars. Wow. The wow. Somebody else in Freiburg, actually, did a, an XRF analysis, which uh, basically fluoresces the surface of materials and tells you where they came from. And they found out that the gold had come from Cornwall. Oh. And the tin in the bronze had come from Cornwall. Amazing. So we, oh, yeah. so we might be able to now, if you think of some of the objects like the knives, the rings, the brooches, those kind of things we find, we're able to tell you, and also the bodies, because the DNA work, as you know, on yeah. burials now, the teeth, the oxygen isotope analysis, means that archaeology has got a bit of scientific magic back. Yeah, yes, exactly. No, I mean, it's, I think... I think that it, it, it's that idea as well as the journey of things um, across the globe as well as across time. Um, and the fact that now you really can say, yes, this absolutely, this paper is is too modern. No, it can't it can't be there. Or this cup, no, that that is actually a cup, a Saxon cup. Um, you know, and living where I do in Sussex, you know, there are so many, um, you know, the past is is very current here i would say and you know i don't know if you know i'm sure you do know this that bogner regis which is down the, the road from where i am in chichester is the only town named after a saxon queen um which is you know which is just, i don't know why that's just so charming but it, it it kind of is so everywhere that sort of sense of the past being alive and it having a significance now through objects is is, is very current here in a way that I, it isn't always in a big city i think there's two programs. We did two programs in Sussex, which we dug out of the Time Team archives because we knew we were going to talk to you. One of them was Beauport Park, which is a site, an, a Roman a site where they made the iron for the Roman fleet, the classic right. of Britannicus. <laughs> and we dived into the, the community and the woodland there and were looking for this site. Um, and one of the things we had was um, a chap called Jake who reproduced iron making for us. Oh, lovely. And I sometimes think when I'm looking at your objects and enjoying your stories about them, one of the fun things we were able to do on Time Team was to go and find out how that thing was made. How did they smelt bronze? Yeah, yeah. How did tin yeah. get from Cornwall to Israel? Yeah, um, yeah. That sort of thing. And it was an important part of the programme, really. Um, 
And so that goes back to your Citadel book, um, because I, uh, Arianus's journey with that codex. Yes. Um, there's that whole thing of the writing, the ink, which I think you talk about is very important and, and the traveling of it. And I thought in a way, I found parts of the Citadel quite uh, difficult because it's, it's difficult stuff, that French, the battle. And I felt as a book, yeah. um, there's some, we're very near to those people. My yeah, yeah. once went to a, um, a, a celebration of the Maquis, a celebration of the resistance in France. And some of the old people that came out from the local farms who were still alive could remember those horrors. And Citadel was the a book that had that cold, some of that coldness of what happened in yeah, Europe. Yeah. yeah, and and it's very noticeable, you know, in the, the Bastille, the main town of Carcassonne, you know, all of the streets in the, the middle have been renamed uh, for members of the Carcassonne resistance. But also, we didn't know this. As you say, the, these these memories, they're, they're living memories, and the shadows are long. And when we were first in Carcassonne, we just went to the main square and we sat down in... Uh, my husband is, is bilingual and used to live in Paris and uh, always goes to the place where the local people are, not the touristy places, you know, and it quite often looks shabbier and you know all, all of those sorts of things and we just went to a particular bar bar felix which appears in most of the books in one way or another and it was only years later that we discovered by making that choice we had essentially chosen the resistance cafe as opposed to the collaborators cafe which is on the other side of the square and it is the most extraordinary thing and as time went on and the more we spent time in Carcassonne, meeting people some of the people in the, in the city itself, their parents were evicted by Nazis from the city. And there is a particular restaurant where when I was there filming with a German film crew for a publication, I think of Labyrinth actually, uh, they were really bizarrely rude and were kind of banging their things down on the table. And, and in the end, my husband went to the owners and said, you know, it's quite important, you know, could you be a bit, you know? And afterwards she said, yes, fine. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll, we'll tell you afterwards. When they had all gone, we joined them at the at the counter, you know, the zinc. Um, and her mother came down and she was, I, I regret to tell you, dressed as a woman from central casting would be dressed, all in black and, you know, all of this. And she didn't really say anything, but she went over to the middle of the restaurant and lifted up a, a mat in the middle of the restaurant, about wooden floors. And there was a trap door. And she said, the last time we had so much German spoken in this restaurant, I had 12 Jewish children in that cell. No. And it was, no. yeah. so of course, just, of course, these are modern young filmmakers, yeah. but the experience of that had just been, and, and then, you know, everything about that. And so Carcassonne was absolutely on the cusp. It had SS and SD uh, sort of, um, and, and a milice headquarters there. It was obviously the headquarters of um, the resistance and the Mackie were up in the hills. So some towns were one or the other, but Carcassonne, as with the Huguenot period, um, it was divided down the middle. You know, Carcassonne in 1592, in the end, after two years of stalemate, the city was for the Catholics, Bastide was for the Protestants, and then they had to shake hands on the bridge. And so it was in the Second World War with Citadel. So it was an uncomfortable book to write because it, you felt that the shadows were still very, very long there. For those of you who um, should um, read the book to find those details out, um, I have to say that rather nicely, um, the coming together of the Codex <laughs> and the successful conclusion, which I won't tell anybody about, but I rather like the fact that um, the Codex provides the answer. And it seems at the end of the book, Quite a lot of the strings from your past all collect together. Yes. <laughs> the baddies get it in the neck is all I have to I say. I think it's very important. You know, I grew up uh, with my lovely dad um, reading the adventure stories that he'd liked as a boy, yeah. which were entirely inappropriate in every possible way. But it did mean that at the age of five, my father, until my mother discovered this, was reading me King Solomon's Mind for my bedtime reading. And I have a love of that. You know, I'm, I'm described as a historical fiction writer. I don't think of myself like that. I think of myself as an adventure 
writer. And I, I like the moral certainty of adventure writing, which is terrible things are going to happen. But in the end, there is a clear dividing line between the goodies and the baddies. There's no ambivalence. And in the end, good triumphs. And I like a story that finishes like that, you know, and that, that goes right back to, you know, reading all of those books, Ivanhoe, Robert Louis Stevenson, all of those, you know, many of their views now are very, very um, uncomfortable for modern ears and eyes, and rightly so. But the sense of momentum and jeopardy and excitement of that old Victorian uh, writing, you know, you can't beat it. You can't beat an old fashioned adventure story. And I think the other thing I feel you've done, Kate, is insert very nicely into there a whole set of rather wonderful female heroines who manage to, one way or another, bring it off. They they yeah. have to suffer quite a bit at times, but there they are. The Alice Tanner is a wonderful character. I think I'd quite like to follow her in her career. In our <laughs> well, maybe I'll bring her back. I'll go and find her. No, but you know what? It's also, as you know this so well, um, is that history is, as we've said before, it is partial and it is biased. And women are written out of the history books. It's not that they were not there and that it's not that we were not as active um, in every community as possible. And when you're writing about different periods of history, you could be forgiven, particularly in the period I'm writing about at the moment, 15th, 16th, 17th century, because of the nature of writing about history, which was done by a certain type of a uh, man writing a certain sort of male history, you sometimes you would think that the only women that existed in the 16th century were queens. Nobody else did. There were a few women over there, then you know, in the fields or whatever. But basically, everybody else was royal. Um, you know, but that was it. But of course, the minute you start to use common sense, and you, of course, when you are excavating, will find this the evidence in the in the land is that the men had been at war for a generation and a half. So who do we think were running the shops and milking the cows and chopping the wood? You know, so I'm very careful. I don't uh, give characteristics to women that would not have been appropriate at the time, but in the South of France in particular, which had a different kind of system, uh, and back to the Cathars that there were you know, not a lot, but there were female as well as male priests. It's just always go back to the actual evidence and discover that there are periods of history. So I would you know, be hard pushed in certain periods of history to be writing adventure stories with women at the heart of it and in certain countries. But always women and men have worked side by side. And that's what I try to do in my stories, you know, that women and men are there in it together. And when I was explaining to my lovely dad when I was writing Labyrinth that I was I said, you know, I'm writing an old fashioned adventure story really, um, much like the ones you used to read to me, but the difference is that in my books, it's the girls that get have swords. And he looked at me and he said, darling, I've waited all of my life for a woman on a horse with a sword. Come and rescue me. <laughs> so, you know, we know, we know. I think I like also a phrase you use somewhere, which is your heroines get to win things, but they also get a nice dress. I think. <laughs> but I think it's, it's I think you often see this in crime writing as well. It's the idea that in order to be active and to be successful in your quest, as it were, because essentially mine are quest novels, then you've got to suffer in other areas. And I kind of always feel, well, why can't, you know, I'm a happy person. Well, I mean, you know, we're all being slightly challenged by the state of things at the moment, but, but broadly speaking. And I think that sometimes when people are happy, they, they can be very successful at the quest they've got to do. The idea that everybody, every hero has to be suffering and tortured. You know, every crime writer, uh, you know, detective needs to be an alcoholic and, you know, every woman detective has to be unmarried and miserable. Well, you know, what about they can be okay <laughs> as well? You know, they can be normal. <laughs> um, you know, so I think that's quite important as well because there's always the idea that, you know, the past is smelly and dirty and everybody's miserable. Well, it was their, it was their present, you know, so, Let's let's have a bit of joy in our historical, uh, you know, writing as well as uh, uh, as the tough stuff. Kate, I've got a, f a couple of last questions. Um, first of all, very much looking forward to the Burning Chambers and the Huguenot series, which I think I imagine there's going to be two or three of these coming out. There's going to be four in all. The Burning Chambers came out a couple of years ago. 
Um, and that is the beginning, the eve of the wars of religion in France. And, um, you know, the, the fact that really, um, although there'd been religious strife and war rumbling on, the fact that it was absolutely power play at the top that turned a civil war, uh, you know, a, a unleashed a civil war in France. Um, and the idea that certainly in Carcassonne on the eve of that, you know, 1562, Neighbours, Jewish neighbours, Catholic neighbours, Protestant neighbours, even atheists, lived alongside each other. Um, they didn't define themselves by faith, but they were forced to do so. And the second one, The City of Tears, comes out in January, and that is set in mostly in Paris and Amsterdam, and a little bit in my very beloved Chartres. Um, and then the third one, which I'm working on at the moment, is in the Canary Islands. Oh. Um, because obviously the big trading routes uh, down to the south. And then the fourth one is in South Africa, in Franschhoek and Spellenbosch and Cape Town, and that finishes in 1862. So it's a, it's a big sweep of, of history, 300 years of history, a feud between two families, Catholic and Protestant, and you will not be at all surprised to know a missing relic, a missing will and a testament, um, because, again, you know, my lead character, Minu, is the daughter of a bookseller. And you know, <laughs> I will look forward to that. Um, a couple of final questions. I uh, you've seen a time team somewhere along the line, I guess. Oh yes, loads. I'm I'm very big fan of time team. Um, if we were able to sort of bring together all that experience of the people who did it and bring some new people along and things, do you think there's a good reason for bringing it back? I think. Uh, I mean, I, was, I, don't, I don't want to sound absurdly over the top here, but I actually think it's essential because we are living in the most extraordinary times. Normally, as an author, when I'm on tour, I will say things like, even with the Burning Chambers, I could say this two, two years ago, uh, you know, we don't normally know we're living through history. Now, the one thing now is we know we're living through history, and it's, the, it's these are dark times. We can see what is happening, but yet we seem to be unable to stop a lot of this. But one of the things that I do, what I do, and Time Team does what you guys do, is to keep, if you like, to move away from the perfidy of people speaking and writing and lying back to the evidence of the land. And Time Team does that. It says you might think this field is just a field. You might think you might have grown up believing that this was the story of that battle of the Civil War or, you know, the, the, the Norman Conquest. Why did 1066, you know, in October happen? Well, it actually happened because of the battle right up north in September before that, where Harold um, Godwinson's troops were just, they were exhausted. You know, they were exhausted and they won and they, by the time they came back, they were, they'd got nothing left to give to William the Conqueror. Now, when you look at the Battle of Stamford Bridge and the excavation that happens there, and then you see the numbers of, you know, the, the battlefield, quite what a ferocious battle that was. That is what makes sense of why the Normans were able to get us in October. And my family came over in that army. My family is Norman, the Moss Band. So I, you know, I have no... Um, so for me, the, what Time Team does, it's not simply entertainment. It is about, in times where the truth is quite hard to find, the land tells us the truth. And so... You know, I will be right there with a gin and tonic in front of my television screen or even more hoping to be invited to come and have a look. Uh, so, yes, Time Team should certainly be back. We need we need some truth. We need some evidence. Very beautifully put. Um, <laughs> the land tells us the truth, I think, is a lovely, lovely idea. And a final little question. Um, I'm going to take you with me somewhere. We're going to do an excavation. When we did the White Queen site with Philippa Gregory, we were able to find some lead glass, lead and glass from the windows of the chapel of one of her main characters. And I got hold of Philippa and said, Philippa, this is from that period and the chapel. If I was able to take you to some site and we were to find some object, something related to all your history, all your stories, what would you most like us to be side by side excavating that you reach out your hand and you touch the past? Well, I'm, I'm going to throw something in from left of field here now because we've not talked about this at all because I haven't yet written 
this, but I am working on a play in oh. this area. Um, and it would be Jerusalem, the tomb of the great Queen Melisande, um, a woman who has been terribly left out of history. And why? Because she actually brought peace. You know, she was the eldest daughter of, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the king then, Baldwin II. Um, she was married off to uh, Anjou, uh, who thought that he could come in and change everything. And in the end, they were crowned as equal queen and king, not him as the king and her as his consort. And we know very little about Melisande except for the Melisande Psalter, which is in the British Library, which I have seen. It is rumoured to be an apology, essentially, from her husband for having waged war against her and trying to beat her. And she was the most incredible woman of the 11th century and who ruled essentially peacefully for 30 years. And there is a tiny, so maybe two round down an old alley there, but I believe that there must be more evidence of Melisande. And I am that that is my next big project. And to find a crown or a, anything really that belonged to her, um, the nunnery that her younger sister founded, great scriptorium that she founded. Um, we know we have the Psalter, the Psalter has survived, but something from that extraordinary coronation in, I can't remember off the top of my head when it was, maybe 1130, maybe, you know, certainly the middle of, of, of the 12th century, something that belonged to Melisande, that would transform how we look at the, that period of history in the Crusader States. So I'm going to put you down in the Aura Project for a time team dig, two places, um, Kingsley Vale, Kingly Vale, yeah. Kingly Vale. And something connected with Merlisande. Yeah. Require a little higher budget, perhaps, if we're going over. Oh, yes, yes. And yes, no, not an easy part of the world to excavate, as we know. <laughs> but we have friends who've done it. We, yeah. we Time Team has friends in interesting places. Um, Kate, thank you very much. One of the joys of doing this is that in order to have a chat with you, I had to find out more about the Visigoths than I ever thought I would have to, <laughs> and various other things, and that's been a, a lovely return, and it's been a great pleasure talking to you, and I wish you luck with the new series. Thank and you. Thank you for your time. It's been a great pleasure, and I very much hope that we will see you all back on the screen soon. <laughs> <laughs>